Okay, I think we're going to start. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome you all, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to the, today's presentation of Get Lost, uh, European Return Policies and Practice, uh, which will be followed by a debate. Um, my name is Anna Schwarz. I'm heading the Global Transformation Program of the Heinrich Böll Foundation's office here in Brussels. Um, the Heinrich Böll Foundation is a political foundation which is very close to the um, Green, to the German Green Party, and we conduct and support civic education activities uh, in Germany, but also with uh, over 30 offices well, worldwide. Um, before I get more into the topic of uh, today's event, I want to address some technical issues. So, um, first of all, I want to let you know that this um, event is going to be recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel afterwards. Um, also, um, the event is going to take place in French and English. We have simultaneous interpretation, which you can access in the toolbar down uh, in your Zoom screen. Um, you can click on the globe and choose the language you want to hear, and then you're going to have uh, only English or French. You can, of course, also stay in the original channel and hear uh, the language that is uh, spoken currently. Um, um, we're going to have the possibility to have a Q&A after the debate um, for, uh, for that uh, purpose. Please uh, raise as many questions as you want to uh, over the Q&A button also down in the Zoom bar. Um, and please indicate if you address your question to one of the panelists, to the whole panel, and also um, if you want to stay anonymous. Um, to today's event, uh, during the last uh, years, a more efficient return policy was very high on the agenda of the European Commission and also the European member states. I think that's fair to say. Um, for this purpose, um, several member states, for example, um, introduced programs that should give uh, incentives uh, to migrants to return voluntarily. Um, and in addition, there were several readmission agreements uh, with third states concluded. The new pact uh, on migration and asylum that was uh, just very recently um, published last week on the 23rd of September. Um, and I have to say that I think our event couldn't be uh, more timely <laughs> due to that. Um, also puts a, a focus on, on the more efficient return policy. Um, however, the fate of migrants that return voluntarily or are being returned um, is not taken into account that much from our point of view. Um, against this background, the Heinrich Böll Foundation decided to conduct a book project um, to shed light on the realities of people that return to their um, countries of origin. Um, and this book was first published in German already last year, and we're going to uh, present the English version um, today. Um, it's also um, available online. We also have printed uh, versions of it as we thought to have a huge uh, public uh, physical event. <laughs> but um, I'm very happy that we still have this event, <laughs> even though uh, very uh, digital and uh, not we, we cannot see each other. Um, in reality. So um, to get a little insight, um, who joins this event today? Um, I prepared a little poll and I would like to ask um, our listeners and participants to, to uh, vote in this poll. Uh, you have two uh, questions that uh, should be visible um, in a second on your screen. And you can choose um, answering options. So the first question is, where are you currently based? Um, one is Northern Europe, one is Southern Europe, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, Brussels, or outside Europe. And I, I'm sorry, um, neither me nor our panelists can vote on that. 
<laughs> even though I know that there would be a different uh, variety of, of answers to this question. I think people are still voting. So as soon as the majority of people voted, um, we can go to the next quest question, I think. Which would be, um, how does EU return policy work at the moment? Very well, well, poorly, very poorly, or I don't know. And also, as soon as everyone or a majority voted, um, we should see the results of the of, of the poll anytime soon on our screens. Do we already have some uh, results? Yes. So, uh, <laughs> many, many of our uh, listeners think that uh, return, EU return policy doesn't work that well at the moment. 44% um, uh, said uh, very poorly, 28% said poorly, but there's also 25% um, that say, I don't know. And I think uh, that's a very uh, positive thing because I'm quite sure after this event, they're going to have a bit more of a clue how it works and how they think about it. Um, I think we don't have a, 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 a result for the first question, but that's not... Um... Ah, yes, we have one. So most people are from Brussels that uh, logged in today, but um, there are also 20% um, that uh, are based outside you, which I find very nice that you took the time to also um, join the meeting. And uh, yeah, many people in Western Europe, but also from Eastern, South and North Europe, that, which is very nice. Thank you very much. So with no further ado, I want to introduce Kirsten Masalbert, the editor of the uh, book that we are presenting today. Um, Kirsten heads the Africa division of the Heinrich Böll Foundation in Berlin and is the coordinator for migration issues in the foundation's um, international department. She worked as an uh, associate expert at the UN in Gaza previously and subsequently uh, directed the Heinrich Böll Foundation's offices in Ramallah and Beirut. Um, Kirsten, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Anna, for the kind uh, presentation. Um, good afternoon to everybody. Very pleased to be here. A warm welcome uh, and hello from Berlin. And by saying so, I, uh, I alert you that you will have to bear with a lot of German in two regards. First, I'm not a native English speaker, so my presentation will be rather humble in English. And secondly, because as Anna said, the book we are launching with this event, Get Lost, is an is an is the English translation with a, a Europeanized intro of a German uh, study book we did uh, called Dahin wo der Pfeffer wächst, which uh, to the ones of you participating knowing some German is a metaphor uh, that we used uh, go away get lost came closest to the original title we had in German. Um, I'm very happy to be here uh, with the Brussels office hosting this event. Thank you very much to all the team in Brussels for organizing it. And I want to say a very, very special thanks to Anna, who is not only moderating today, but who actually uh, uh, 
put a lot, a lot of time and efforts into the English translation and issuing the, the English version. So thanks, big thanks to Anna. What I want to do is, and I hope tech, technical affairs don't fail me now, I want to uh, present in a PowerPoint presentation, basically the questions that Anna raised with her intro, why should we discuss, why should we look at return policies in practice? Um, and then secondly, give you a, a little bit of an insight into the, into the book, uh, into the booklet, I should say, Get Lost, um, just enough to make you curious enough to really want to read some of the chapters. Um, I will try to put this on the right mode. Yep. So as Anna said, why should we talk about uh, return policies? Basically because they have risen high on the, on the agenda, as well as in politicians' rhetorics about migration management. And the book actually starts with such rhetoric, and that is that of the European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker, uh, the former uh, president, of course, who in his 2017 State of the Union speech said the following, people who have no right to stay in Europe must be returned to their countries of origin. When only 36% of irregular migrants are returned, it is clear we need to significantly step up our, our work. This is the only way Europe will be able to show solidarity with refugees in real need of protection. So this is more or less the rhetorics we are not only he hearing from the EU uh, politicians, but also from member state politicians. And we wanted to shed some light on the realities um, behind this rhetorics. So first saying, is it really working? Is it working well? Is it working humane? And then also what alternatives to this trend could be in the political debate. Um, we also did the, the, the studies, the country studies in, in, a, in a background of an overall decrease in numbers of migrants. And I want to point out that this, this trend to wanting to make uh, return policy more effective is against uh, decreasing of numbers of migrants arriving in Europe. Uh, still re return remained the focus with the trend to ever more restrictive policies, laws, and regulations. Um, I have a problem seeing all the images, so I have to move them. Otherwise, I can't go through my presentation, but I think I'll manage in a second. Um, EU institutions, as well as member states, are putting greater efforts into building more effective return policies and still face numerous problems in implementation. And the chart I'm showing you here illustrates this um, graphically. Uh, relevant to our reading of the situation is the red line, which over the years uh, pointed out here, show the orders um, to leave the European Union, any EU member state, and the green lines are divided by actually returned and returned to a non-EU member state. Uh, is less than half of the ordered ones. In figures, you see this uh, for, oops, now I was too fast. We had about close to 500,000 um, issued uh, orders to leave the European Union, whereas we had 198,000 um, actually returned people. This included the voluntary return people um, which is which which states that less than 42 percent were actually returned. So it is factually not working for a variety of reasons. I don't want to discuss at this point. Um, but it is also questionable whether this should be um, only be made more effective or, or whether there's alternatives to deportations and this kind of voluntary returns. This chart shows you uh, briefly uh, the countries people are returned to, Ukraine ranking the highest for the years 2018 and 2019, followed by Albania, Morocco, Georgia, Russia, Algeria, Iraq, and so on. Um, recognition rates uh, of first instance, the top 20 citizenships uh, with, the, with the highest uh, recognition rates 
are uh, illustrated on this uh, Eurostat uh, picture. Uh, top, top of the top 20 is Venezuela uh, with a recognition rate at first instance only of 96%. 85% for Syria, Eritreans are recognized in most cases, 81%. Afghanistan is uh, further down to 54%. And then I also put some numbers, uh, Germany ranking very high and granting protection status, as you know, with 116,000 for, that counts for 39% of the total in Europe. Um, Current situation 2020, of course, due to the pandemic, uh, COVID-19, we saw that uh, we saw a decrease in returns, enforced returns, obviously also in voluntary returns. Um, there was a kind of stalemate for some time. The first half of 2020 clearly shows uh, uh, a decrease of numbers of returns. However, and I wanted to point this out, we also saw a, a, an increase of pushbacks. Uh, kind kind of tolerated, uh, especially with the Greek practice of uh, taking thing, uh, uh, taking migrants who were uh, on the Greek islands into boats and, and pushing them out in the sea. So this is also a kind of illegal return that was practiced throughout 2020. Uh, kind of tolerated. Uh, we will discuss this, I'm sure, later. And then since mid-July 2020, several EU member states resumed uh, returns some were assisted by Frontex, and Frontex is taking up this role um, uh, more and more as we see. The, uh, the new pact on migration and asylum, and I also mentioned it, was just issued. This event is very, uh, uh, it's only shortly after 23rd of September, issuing of the pact, big press conference, lots of reactions. We're seeing lots of think tank papers appearing, commentaries, etc. I just wanted to point out uh, uh, the, the pact with regards to return policies, our issue today uh, has a new uh, mechanism introduced. That's one of the few really big news in the, in the pact as commentaries see it. So I call it the new kit on the block, which is the return sponsorship. And in brief, and I'm sure Francesco, you, you will correct me if I'm wrong, but the way I understood this uh, 300 pages uh, of of the new regulations and, and, uh, and explanations of the pact. What is meant by return sponsorship is that the member states of the European Union, um, not wanting to take any of the um, people uh, allocated for uh, proper asylum procedures to be taken up, and therefore not receiving any of the people um, uh, going through the first uh, scan positively, can take over uh, return sponsorship instead, meaning that that member state is then responsible for returning a person on behalf of another member state of first entry, such as Greece or Italy on the outside borders, in case the return efforts on that person fail, the member states who took the return sponsorship must then receive the person. And that maybe explains the, the, the vivid uh, refusal of the Visegrad uh, countries and, and Austria right after the pact was issued. Uh, what is questionable to my concern uh, is whether this is an unregulated bilateral influence then that we can foresee. Uh, let's, let's take Hungary or Poland not wanting to receive in people with uh, taking, uh, taking upon themselves the return sponsorship are then are they then negotiating um, the implementation of readmission to Tunisia, Morocco, and the like? And under what circumstances do they put pressure or diplomatic efforts into that? The new elder on the block, as I call him, as the returns coordinator, a new position uh, created. I will skip the recognition data slides I prepared. I just wanted to, to point out that um, the new mechanism uh, suggests a pre-selection of asylum seekers and all the citizens with rates, with, with recognition rates, at first instance, I understand, underneath 20% should go through this rapid scanning process or the rapid process, um, pre-selection process. That means uh, a first uh, check whether uh, the asylum uh, 
um, sort is applicable within 12 weeks. And that, uh, that also means with regards to return policy, uh, newly uh, regulated then that within 12, well, that return should be enforced no later than 12 weeks after a negative conclusion of this case. So this is all new and we have many questions and I'm sure the discussion will also highlight some of the, the loopholes and, and questions uh, arising from this. I just want to point out that uh, given Afghanistan as exa an example, these recognition rates underneath 20% are in some cases possibly very questionable because they vary uh, in, in the European Union dramatically. If you take Afghanistan as an example, you have some, the, the recognition rates vary country by country from 6% to 98%. That's dramatical because it says some member states think that nobody should be deported to Afghanistan and other, others actually practice. As I point out, 10 countries do practice deportation to Afghanistan. Second big issue, voluntary returns. I will just briefly introduce it. While forced return is not effective, as I pointed out um, with the graphics also, efforts to raise the numbers of voluntary returns are being enforced by the European Union as such as um, the institutions, but also by member states. Between 2014 and 2018, 116,723 persons receive assistance from EU funds for it to return voluntarily to their country of origin. And this is a graphic that shows by country overall in the EU, you see that it's kind of 50-50 enforced returns is the blue and the yellow is voluntary return. Financing for voluntary return has uh, magnified. There's different uh, instruments, financial instruments. I've named some of them. I just wanted to point out that we also did in, uh, released in March 2019 a study tracing the money of the EUTF. We called the study money against migration, partly because when you trace the money of the EUTF, you find, for instance, that 10% of funding for improving cooperation on return and sustainable reintegration um, goes into projects, uh, whereas only 1% is earmarked for advancing legal migration and mobility possibilities. So in the second part, I will uh, talk about the pu uh, publication and, and maybe the rationale. What we thought was not enough highlighted in all the debates on why should we make returns more effective is what actually is happening to the people uh, returned uh, or voluntary returnees in their countries of origin. So we did a couple of country studies. We asked uh, um, expert journalists, etc., to go out and research what, should, what is actually happening to these people. And what we did with the publication is two things. We shed light on the, at times, dramatic realities for deportees by looking into realities on the ground in Afghanistan and Syria. And we also exemplary uh, picked uh, Tunisia, Senegal, and Kosovo as case studies or country studies to uh, give insights on the real realities of reintegration efforts. The underlining idea for the publication was that migration, we see it, is the normal and should not be stopped, um, but regulated in a humane way and in a triple win manner. Triple win is probably familiar to most of you. It's, it's a win situation for the country of origin, the individual and the country of receipt. So having said that, uh, what we what we say after having done this country studies uh, is a clear no to forced returns into unsafe situations. And the um, studies both on Afghanistan and Syria show that situation for returnees are unsafe. I know this will be questioned, um, but um, it is questioned, of course, by many of the, of the member states, uh, um, analysis of the situation. We uh, asked an, uh, an expert on Afghanistan, uh, Friedrich Steinmann, a German national, to do um, an analysis of the situation for us. And I just want to briefly point out on the Afghanistan chapter that the author, Friedrich, was able to compile information on 47 
of the 512 men in all cases from Afghanistan who were deported from Germany until February 2019. To the extent that this was possible for her, the information gathered by, were by means of standardized questionnaires and was augmented by interviews conducted with the contact persons as well as deportees themselves. She, she of course had great difficulties reaching out from Germany to returnees because they were living in hiding and, and, were, and, and interviews would have endangered there. So she worked through contact people and, and, and support groups. And she uh, then interviewed quite a lot of people who had been deported. Uh, I just want to point out on, on some examples for uh, what these returnees went through. In one case, the Taliban learned within a week that a person had returned. He was taken captive and physically abused for three days as punishment for his flight and to force him into their ranks. He was only able to escape because an acquaintance who had just recently joined the Taliban let him go away. These dangers, unfortunately, are daily reality. The 23 deportees who were interviewed and were still in the country two months later and were able to provide information, therefore, reported 34 violent incidents and threats of violence against them or their families due to their return even though 21 of these 23 mostly remained in hiding. So this is facts and figures uh, we, we, that made us say we must debate a clear no to forced returns into such situations where the individual cannot make a living because he or she has to live in hiding, uh, dangers are exposed, etc. There is great discussions about Syria, at least in Germany. I know that in some other member states as well whether safe returns to Syria would be possible in the near future. Our author is clearly illustrating how this is an illusion and we should, uh, we should uh, say a clear no to returns to Syria as well. Um, with regards to reintegration programs, uh, we say they are good. It's, it's good they exist. Um, it is much better to assist people who want to voluntarily return to their countries than not to do that. But the current programs we've, we've looked into with the country studies definitely can need improvements. The main questions uh, we raised after reviewing the country reports were um, whether the current practice in many of the member states really states that um, these returns are, are actually voluntary because very often information policies um, give as alternatives to the voluntary and assisted return. It's really voluntary. And the current reintegration efforts uh, seem not very suitable in many cases for meeting the needs of the individual in the country of origin, neither the structural challenges of return. And if Anna indicates that I have another two, three minutes, I would, uh, I would uh, put some um, examples for, um, for Tunisia, but I don't know if my time is up. So please, Anna, help me indicating time. If you can make a very brief comment on Tunisia, that would be more than welcome to kick off the discussion. Super, I'll, I'll try to be uh, two, three minutes. Um, so everybody knows that Tunisia went through, uh, witnessed not only a revolution uh, from within, um, but also went through a, a dramatic political transition. Uh, with regards to, to migration, we, uh, we uh, put into the Tunisia chapter, we put some uh, figures that indicate that even though Tunis Tunisia had achieved the transition, the number of Tunisians clandestinely getting onto boats to make the passage to Lampedusa or Sicily has had recently uh, increased. While Italy registered only 569 Tunisians who entered the country illegally in 2015 and only 820 in 2016, the number jumped to 6,151 in 2017 and again to over 6,000 in 2018. 
So what does that tell us? It tells us for, for reintegration programs that we're still, and after the political transition, that we are, we are up against structural problems that are, that are very much within the economic situation in Tunisia. So the fact that six years after the Arab Spring, the number of irregular migrants, so-called irregular migrants from Tunisia jumped up and has since remained at an elevated level, we primarily want to attribute to the economic situation and Wajdi will, uh, will uh, amplify on that later. Um, economically, the vast majority of Tunisians are worse off today than under the dictatorship. While the economy after two meager years showed the renewed growth of 1.9% in 2017 and even 2.8% in 2018, real wages have fallen drastically from the equivalent of 290 euros on average in 2011, the year of the revolution, to 223 euros in 2017. So 223 euros a wage makes you dream of earning more money working in Italy in the crops or, or elsewhere. Um, we asked our author to go to more remote areas in Tunisia and he went, he actually picked Kasrin, which is 300 kilometers southwest of Tunisia. Um, and he looked, he, he met a lot of youth uh, in, in this town of Kasrin and interviewed them. And, uh, and he, the author noted the following in, his, in, the, in the chapter on Tunisia. For many youth of Kasrin, the alternatives to ISIS and Al-Qaeda, the two jihadist uh, groups uh, uh, working in this area, both of which have their Tunisian branches in the border region with Algeria, and to twiddling their thumbs in the forgotten province, goes by the name of Haraga. This is what the people are called who board the boats on the coast to get to Europe. Haraga is a word derived from the Arabic word for burn. Haraga are those who burn their personal documents so as not to be identifiable. So this tells you a bit about um, why it is difficult to uh, implement uh, a return, but it also tells you what reintegration programs are up against in structural, structural conditions economically. So how do you put a person returning from Italy or returning from Germany into Tunisia, into a, into a labor market, which is, uh, which is providing the facts and figures I just illustrated. So I hope this gives some food for thought and debate. And thank you very much. And I hope I didn't exceed the time too much. Thank you very much, Kirsten. I, I'm, I'm very sure that that plays a very good base for our debate. Um, I want to um, introduce now uh, our three other panelists of today. I'm very happy that you had the time to discuss with us today. Um, first of all, I want to introduce Tine Kestrik. She is a member of the European Parliament for the Dutch Green Party Groen Links. She is the rapporteur for the recast of the Directive on Common Standards and Procedures in Member States for Returning Illegally Staying Third Country Nationals. I had to read this, I'm sorry. Um, before um, she became a member of the European Parliament, she was an uh, associate professor for migration law at the University of Nimwegen and a member of the Dutch uh, Senate. Uh, thank you for joining, Tineke. Um, our second panelist is Francisco Gastello Mesquires. He is head of the unit for irreg irregular migration and return policy in uh, the general directed uh, direct uh, for migration and ho home affairs. His previous posts uh, include head of unit for MFF budget and agency, assistant to the director general of Asia Pacific, deputy head of the unit of the Middle East and deputy head of cabinet of the vice president of the inter uh, for the internal market defense and space. So a very broad portfolio that we bring with you. I'm also very happy that you have the time to discuss with us. And our last panelist is Vashti Filali. Um, he is the project manager Manager for Migration and Alternative Economy at the Heinrich Böll Foundation's office in Tunis. And before he joined the foundation, he worked with the Red Cross Tunisia in, a, in the framework of a project 
for the protection and support of refugees and asylum seekers in Tunisia. Thank you also, Vashti, that you join our debate today. Um, so first of all, I want to talk a little bit more about the challenges of the current EU return policy. And then in the second part of the debate, I would like to, um, yeah, I would like to learn <laughs> more about uh, uh, how the new pact on immigration and asylum may tackle these challenges. So, uh, Mr. Gastello Mesquires, looking at the numbers that Kirsten just um, presented, um, the EU return policy um, doesn't seem to be very efficient, actually. So, why is it that? Is that so, from your perspective? I will. I will blame it to my 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 predecessors because you know I've been only one year in the in the, in the job. No, no, no. That that's that's, that's not, um, of course. Uh, um, a real reason or real point to make. Listen, I mean, it's, um, if you ask, I think the people who will say or who have maybe replied to the um, questionnaire and have uh, said that the return policy doesn't work or works poorly, which I think was uh, at least uh, I think a majority or at least a substantial amount of people, uh, I think they will give you probably different reasons. You know, some people are going to tell you we're returning too few people. They will say, you know, it's you know one third you know, this return rate. It is miserable. It is far too little. Or the people are going to tell you, you know, we are returning far too much uh, because actually the return is uh, should be actually uh, you know more dignified, you know, uh, given more guarantees and protection. For example, in the case of Afghanistan, maybe we should reduce uh, re reduce the returns, we should maybe stop the returns, uh, what uh, totally. So there will be different reasons. So <clears throat> for me, and with my brief experience, if you want in the area of return, I cannot really tell you what the, what the perception of people is is uh, in according to my view. Or, you know, true is uh, genuine or not, I and mean, the perception is genuine, but whether it corresponds to the reality or not. If you look at the return rate, and I think there, for example, I think Mr. Strict will also coincide, it is really not a very good indicator. It is an indicator, it's important to take it into account, but it's not a very good indicator because always has, for example, a time lag. And uh, when you have, uh, you know, people arriving regularly or going through the assessment process, you know, for the asylum applications, then, of course, until you return these people, it take it take a while. It means that, for example, if you look at the number of irregular arrivals today, it's about 1,200, uh, one, sorry, 120,000 people. If you look, we're returning 190,000 people, then you would say, okay, actually, return rate according to the number of irregular arrivals is, is huge. It's, it's over 100%, so it is a fantastic success we are empty in Europe, for example, you know. So uh, with this, the only thing I'm, 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 I'm trying to say is that the return rate is just one indicator. It is far from perfect, has to be taken into account, but it's not the most important one. Is return, uh, could return policy be improved? Certainly can be improved uh, substantially. And, and as uh, we know, we have two, two main limitations in my view. One of them is how the return procedures work in the, in the European Union and how effective uh, you know, effective. When I say effective, means in two in two ways. Effective in terms of efficiency and optimization of the procedures. The other one in terms of the quality of the procedures. So for me, an effective return is a is a quality return. This as well a, a well processed uh, and, and procedure return. So um, if you look at that, this is one of the limitations. You know, how to improve legislation, how to improve the implementation of legislation in a way that the loopholes and gaps are minimized, so that member states can really uh, return with full guarantee and full protection of all uh, rights and principles that need to be guaranteed, in particular the principle of non-refoulement, which is, for example, now at the stake when we discuss the Afghanistan uh, case. But also, you have the problem, of course, of uh, readmission in cooperation with third countries. And this as well the other uh, important leg, if you want, in this equation. Uh, cooperation with third countries is you know, sometimes very good if you look at the Balkan countries, or the Eastern European countries, or the Central Asian countries, but it is uh, quite poor when you look, for example, at many of the African uh, countries, for example, or the North African countries. With variety or you know, a variable, you want uh, capacity of return uh, from a member state to member state as well. So that's why I think the PAC would have made a very big effort in, trend, in terms of trying to improve and give a big boost if you want to the return policy. Uh, as you know, uh, you have mentioned, I think, uh, uh, 
Yeah, Mrs. Mas Albert has mentioned a number of things, but I will just have a very quick overview, and with this I will finish. But uh, uh, this, this this first introduction, we are proposing a legal framework that should be a bit better or fitter for purpose and fully coherent with the asylum system. So that's what we're trying to do in full respect of fundamental rights. Uh, Mrs. Strick is the rapporteur for the return directive. I believe that out of these negotiations, we have a return directive that will be more effective and better function, more functional and better working. Um, then we are clearly putting more emphasis than ever on voluntary returns, not only as part of the return directive, but also as part of the overall pact strategy. Uh, you know that we are going to launch, and this is linked to one of the points, uh, one of the points that Kirsten made, is that we are going to develop a strategy, implementation strategy for returns and reintegration, for voluntary returns and reintegration. And indeed, reintegration might not be working in all cases very well. So clearly, we all collectively have to make as many efforts as possible to make sure reintegration works better. And this much more systematized in according to a number of certain standards to improve the quality of reintegration. For me, I'm an, you know, a fully convinced and determined person that I think we increase the, if we first of all apply voluntary return systems, if we manage that every member state has a voluntary return scheme, and then we put more money and we spend the money better in reintegration, clearly we're going to improve both immensely the quality of the returns and the numbers of returns as well. Uh, then, as you know, we also have been working with Frontex and Frontex very soon will announce changes in their structure to give more, uh, to have more dedicated resources to returns, uh, to Voluntary returns and reintegration included as well, which was something that Frontex did not do so much in the past, but also to uh, to all other parts of, of compulsory returns. Then we're going to have as well as uh, the new, I think, or the new elder in the block, or new elder, so to say, that Kirsten said as well, which is the return coordinator, will be supported by a high-level network on return. This person has to be really working among member states to make sure that they support each other and as well that the different things, the things that they are applying differently are more harmonized. So when member states are applying procedures in a different way or they are encountering different technical uh, technical barriers, this coordinator will be there to try to iron out these, uh, these difficulties. And then certainly, although has been something, has been said for many, many years, I think certainly my commissioner and the college in general uh, and the institutions, the institutions are fully determined to really make of of the partnership with third countries, something which is a win-win situation, a uh, mutual beneficiary or beneficiary uh, situation, where we really promote the readmission of a more functional policy with readmission and returns, but also we promote to put much more emphasis on legal migration, non-protection as well, and of course, on the economic development of these countries. I think this is a big challenge, let's say, not a big challenge, but it's something which is something we need at the work to be accomplished, uh, accomplished because indeed we have the means, we have the financial means and as well the technical means, means, means sorry, to really invest more on reintegration, but also to invest more on root causes of migration and as well to invest much more in economic development because we know when we move to the return part, when we return someone, it's already the constatation that the, the system has not been well managed, obviously. So it is clear that the number of returns over time should be not increased but reduced in a way as a consequence of more legal migration channels and better, of course, a partnership with their with their countries. So that's what I wanted to say. Just one word on Tunisia, and then I finish, because I think it was one point of this first uh, this introductory part of the of the conversation. Uh, their reunion agreement with Tunisia is is still there. It's going to remain a priority for the Commission for the European Union. Clearly, until now, because COVID nineteen situation as well as the political situation of in Tunisia was not possible to continue with the negotiations. Clearly, there we would like to have a full readmission agreement uh, with Tunisia that will make our readmission policy with Tunisia uh, much more functional. But I think it is very important that in COVID-19 context, we take fully into account as well the impact of this pandemia in the pandemic, sorry, in the, on these uh, countries as well. And we have we take you know, full into account that, you know, in that situation, I think we have to be especially careful um, diplomatic in our contacts with our countries. Then I think later we can discuss a little bit about these elements, I think, that Kirsten has explained, such as the return sponsorship and other uh, issues I think she has detailed, because I think we'll have ample time for this. 
Thank we're, you. We're going to come back to that later. Yeah. Um, but now I also want to uh, give this question to Tineke, actually. So what do you see as the main challenges of the uh, of the current e uh, EU return policy? Uh, I, I imagine that it might be uh, different challenges that you see. OK. <laughs> Thanks for this invitation, and also thanks, Christine, for this presentation of your of your research findings. I really think it's uh, it's it's a rich contribution to the negotiations we are going to enter now on the recast returns directive, but also on the other proposals of the pact. Um, yes, this is actually the key question, right? I mean, um, I, I think there is a common ground for uh, uh, thinking that we want to have, if we have return procedures, that they become more effective in line with the procedural safeguards and uh, dignity and uh, safety, et cetera, et cetera. And then the question indeed is, why is it not effective? Well, I'm, I'm very happy to hear from Mr. Gastulo uh, Mesquides that, uh, that he also says it's not only about return rates as, as, as the main criteria to see if it's effective or not. It has a lot more to do with quality of the returns and that what, what I mean with safety, dignity, but also sustainability. Uh, I mean, you can, uh, pushbacks is also a kind of return indeed, what you say, Kirsten, an illegal return. And uh, uh, apart from the fact that it's violating basic human rights, such as the right to asylum, uh, it's also not sustainable because people will try to re-enter, re-enter. And this can also happen to people who uh, got a return decision on the territory, uh, but who don't want to go back and who are, for instance, forcibly returned or who are returned to a transit country, because this is also what is happening often, especially when it's more difficult or complicated to send someone back to the country of origin. And we have a deal with Turkey and we have uh, deals with other transit countries. And um, in the end, uh, that uh, well, that that could lead to a lack of access to basic needs and rights over there, but also as an incentive to try to come back to uh, Europe again. So I think that's very important. And uh, as the level of voluntariness uh, is really also decisive for uh, uh, the way people are returned and and the preparedness of people to return. Um, I think that we see a lot of problem issues with the new recast proposal that is now on the negotiation table. And what makes this whole negotiation uh, especially difficult is that we lack a motivation by the Commission why we need this recast proposal. Exactly what just been said by Mr. Casola, we don't know why it's not effective, but that makes it so difficult to assess the new proposals. Is the new proposal then the right direction? Will it make returns more effective? And, and we, we have uh, problematized this also because, uh, well, we just simply lack evidence. Uh, the Commission is obliged to come up with implementation reports every three years on how Member States apply the directive. It has not been done since 2014. Uh, there was political pressure also from the Dutch government, I know that, uh, uh, to amend the directive. But then, in 2014, it was the Commission that said, look, there's no need to come up with an amending uh, uh, proposal because the problems that we see with returns are not laying in the returns directive, but in more the cooperation with uh, countries of origin. So now we end up with a, a, a legislative proposal, which I think is a result of political pressure from the member states. But does it lead us to, to, to something or not? Or will it make even things worse? Uh, I'm concerned about the last, because um, as we already said, that voluntary departure, it also uh, uh, appears from, from studies that are being held is the best one. You see that in the current recast proposal, um, the possibilities for voluntary departure are really decreasing and actually in some cases really make uh, impossible because uh, you know people need a voluntary departure term, for instance, and normally it's, it's a term of 30 days, but the proposal obliges member states to refrain from that period 
in case of a risk of absconding. And the, the proposal also foresees in a list of criteria, 16 criteria, that says if one of those criteria apply, then there's a risk of absconding, and then you should refrain from voluntary departure. But if you look at the criteria, they are very broadly defined. It's like if you have entered the country irregularly, if you have no formal place of residence, if you have no financial resources, I mean, almost all of these uh, criteria are applicable, especially to rejected asylum seekers. Um, that, that's what makes me really worrying, and that's one of my objectives, really to, um, to limit that scope and to safeguard the possibility for voluntary uh, departure. I also, uh, uh, in my amendments, I propose to uh, oblige member states to invest much more in uh, assisting voluntary departure, uh, assisting it, including reintegration in the country of origin, so after departure as well, uh, and uh, throughout all stages uh, of the return procedure, whereas the Commission uh, limits it to, uh, well, as long as people are voluntary returning. But I think it's important to give in any stage people an offer to be assisted, to be informed, and, uh, well, to get more possibilities to reintegrate in the country of origin. Um, I also propose to reinforce the monitoring uh, obligations because indeed, on the one hand, the monitoring now is limited to the removal uh, process itself, so only during the return. I want to make that more independent and transparent, but I also extend the monitor to uh, post-arrival because there we can see and control if it's safe, if it's sustainable, or if the European Union should, should change its policies or uh, offer safeguards to the person involved. Um, you already had some research findings. We also know from Afghanistan that Save the Children did a study, uh, whereas the European Union says uh, unaccompanied minors are not uh, uh, transferred and are returned. They find that they are returned and also other children as part of families or who had turned 18 after a long stay in, in, in Europe they really, really have a lot of problems after their return. Um, and then nothing happens, you know? So, so this is really something that we should take care of, that our responsibility includes the post-arrival situations. Um, yes, I, I think, so, so that's, I can say more, but uh, I can also leave it for, for the rest of the discussion. So we need to first find out what are the real problem issues? And, and can we uh, make sure that if we think of more efficiency, that we keep up the procedural safeguards and the dignity of people. And maybe one last sentence on the safety. Indeed, it all also shows how important it is that we get a more common appreciation of the situation in certain countries in order to uh, make sure that, uh, that this uh, non refoulement principle is being uh, complied with uh, throughout Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tineke. Um, one of the big advantages that we have as a foundation are our foreign offices, actually, because uh, all of you already touched upon the question of reintegration. And this is actually what I want to uh, ask Vashti now to uh, tell us a bit more about um, for the Tunisian case. So how... Um, what happens to, to, to people that are returned to Tunisia or that return voluntarily because they are not, there's many people that return also voluntarily. Merci beaucoup, Anna, pour l'invitation et merci. Thank you for your invitation and thank you for asking this question. Now, trying to reply to your question, I'd like to uh, tackle the uh, support granted by the government to uh, returnees. And I'd like to talk about uh, the reintegration programs and the support given by the European Commission. Now, when the migrant arrives in uh, Tunisia, uh, he or she will be uh, uh, taken care of at, uh, at the airport and perhaps that person will spend a few days in uh, prison, perhaps that person will have to pay a fine, or perhaps that person 
will be questioned by the uh, police and then of course uh, the individual will be uh, released in the uh, get lost uh, publication where uh, the um, uh, Catherine episode is mentioned there is a, an agency which is mentioned an agency commissioned by the uh, um, by a um, German body and well, uh, prospects of finding an employment, of uh, uh, setting up a company and carrying out a, uh, uh, a project are taken care of by this agency. However, unfortunately, this agency no longer fulfills its missions. And usually uh, people go to the agency just to have an idea about uh, employment uh, opportunities in Europe and to migrate regularly uh, in Europe. So they no longer consult the agency to uh, find a job in uh, Tunisia, but to find a regular way to um, uh, migrate uh, towards Europe. Then there's another project, uh, the uh, Laman project. It aims at uh, reinforcing the um, civil society organizations and the state organizations to uh, integrate uh, the uh, Tunisian returnees. And I could tell you that uh, the uh, website, the LAM website, indicates that 91 Tunisians have been uh, supported by this program. These 91 Tunisians come from uh, four different regions in the country. Some of the uh, returnees will be embarked in the program, but only a minority, because you cannot force people to uh, be accompanied by uh, the program. And the uh, success rate of uh, the person that will follow the program is quite low. And even among those who will follow the program, some will not pass it, will not be uh, successful. Some will launch a project and will stop afterwards and, and, and will use the money that they have received to start their project to try and go back to Europe. The uh, LAM uh, program has uh, built a roadmap of uh, the different uh, reintegration uh, programs that exist in Tunisia. And there are uh, 14 that are ongoing, uh, supported by France, uh, Germany, Italy, uh, Belgium, among others. And we do see that uh, medical care uh, creating a, a job or um, support in finding a job are the, um, the the programs that most interest the um, uh, returnees. And usually, one part of the assistance that uh, varies from uh, fifteen hundred euro to uh, 2,000 euros, so, so one part will be uh, given uh, before the return and the other, some the other amount of money will be given after the uh, return. And I know that uh, France has got uh, some uh, programs uh, that uh, amount to uh, 6,000 uh, euros. This is a very topical issue. It's uh, worth discussing this uh, a, a bit further, especially if you can provide a very short answer. Yes, I'll make it in a nutshell, promise. Let's say that the vast majority of migrants will feel like they're starting from scratch again. They used to have projects and high hopes when leaving Tunisia for Europe and coming back. They have to start from scratch again. 
their economical situation is very unstable because they've just returned. Some of them would like to come back to Europe uh, again because uh, they haven't had the time to plan their return. And one specific point to clarify here is the fact that uh, the opportunity to give some time to the migrant to, to get organized before uh, re returning to the country of origin might be a, a good idea. So give them the opportunity, give them some time uh, to uh, make a few arrangements. A uh, study was made interviewing uh, a sample of Tunisian returnees um, highlighted the fact that uh, most of the time uh, a big number of returnees uh, uh, were signified uh, the decision on the very day they had to leave the country. So they had no time at all, no opportunity to get organized and to get their return organized. Thank you so much. I also want to talk a little bit about the new pact and um, all of you already um, touched upon some aspects of the pact um, and like one of my main questions when it comes to the current e-return policy and I also re couldn't really find an answer to it uh, in the new pact is what happens or should happen um, in case a person that is obliged to leave the European Union cannot return because the country of origin just simply doesn't allow the return and doesn't agree to it. Um, and I would be very interested in, uh, in your uh, perspective on it, uh, Tineke, but also uh, on your perspective, Mr. gastelum because I think it's kind of, in German we say, the Gretchenfrage. I don't know who wants to uh, start. Maybe Tinika, you can start, and then Mr. Gastello and Ms. Kigis um, comes in afterwards. Yeah, what needs to happen with them, I, I think, um, uh, two points. Uh, I, I think it's important, indeed, um, for member states to really focus on the country of origin. So first, to have a careful asylum procedure. If, if we talk about asylum seekers, eh, there are also other uh, uh, migrants. And then, I, I mean, in that sense, I, I, I'm really disappointed in the new PAC proposal because there the pressure will still be on the border regions, uh, the border countries, and that will also affect the quality of the asylum uh, procedure and decision. I mean, there we will need a fair sharing of responsibility to get a real good asylum procedure and decision that doesn't take too long. I think all these elements are important if you have a good motivated decision, it can also motivate people, convince people better to want to return uh, after uh, um, uh, not too long time. But you're talking about the preparedness of the country itself, of course, the country of origin. Let's focus indeed on that. So uh, stop trying to, to conclude readmission agreements with transit countries. Um, and then really try to overcome the hurdles with the countries of origin. Because if someone really has no right to stay in the European Union, it's his or her right to re-enter his own country, of course. This is something, this is an international obligation or an international right for the citizen of a country, but it's very difficult to enforce. And therefore, I think it's very important to really enter into equal partnerships with those countries, uh, not in the way that is often done by uh, more in a, with a demanding tone and approach. If you saw the last frame, the, the, the partnership framework of the European Commission from 2016, where it actually took the approach, we're not going to, uh, to think of more for more, huh? so trying to seduce states, but for less to less. So say that you have a duty to do so, to cooperate, and otherwise we will use all our instruments, tools, incentives that we have, including development aid. I think this is not the right direction. And you see this conditionality approach uh, emerging also, for instance, in the NDICI, the, the new fund for uh, developing countries or third countries. Um, you see it in the visa regulation saying that only if you cooperate on migration, then you are allowed to, to get visa for your citizens. I think we should stop that approach. Actually, Jonsson also said so. She said during the, the, the presentation, we should not 
threat the countries, but really genuinely cooperate with them, take into account what they need. Uh, but I don't see that reflected in, in, in the proposals and in, in the direction that the Commission and the Member States take. So we really should reconsider our approach. Um, and um, in that sense, also um, acknowledge to a certain extent that some countries of origin benefit from migration, including irregular migration, as people uh, have the migrants who are here uh, use the remittances also in order to support their family over there. I mean, let's acknowledge it. And uh, if they are starting to cooperate with uh, uh, readmission of preventing irregular migration, they will also affect their uh, own position and interests as well. So therefore, I think it's so important to enter the discussions with them on regular migration, uh, more mobility, uh, opportunities for studies, et cetera, et cetera. I think that would be much more fruitful in order to get their uh, cooperation. Now there's really a completely distrust uh, uh, towards the EU, I think, uh, and that should be broken up. If uh, if it comes, but not all migrants are helped with this because this is more long term and, 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 and a lot needs to be done. At the moment, we're really facing uh, migrants who simply don't have an opportunity to, to leave uh, the European Union. And I think, therefore, we also should be honest and uh, say that if people cannot return, that uh, and that's outside of their own control, that there should be a solution in terms of regularizing, uh, giving them the chance to to get a legal residence and to 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 start integrating in, in in the European Union, I think both parallel processes should uh, should be reinforced. Maybe should I, Anna? Yes, please. Yes. Okay. So may, maybe starting by this last point. First of all, indeed, you know, as uh, Mrs. Trick is uh, much more experienced than I am in these things, you know, it's true. I. I want to thank you for the study. I want to thank you for the work. Uh, I was also very happy that we could exchange views before the, it was uh, published as well in the past. I think it's a, a big effort. And of course, this advance as well advances, uh, you know, uh, of course, the information and, and the intelligence in this area. So I think it is, it is very valuable and this discussion is also very useful. Um, so thank you for that. Then second on this, you know that the return directive already, just to come from the current uh, legal context, the return directive in this Article 6, already allows the member states member states sorry to issue residence permits or special permissions for those citizens i uh, sorry for those uh, migrants who should not have in principle the right to stay but for different reasons including the lack of cooperation so the not possibility of exerting the right and the international obligation to return to the country of origin um, is, is not possible so i mean this already exists the legal framework can be used and should be used, I think, by member states uh, uh, and as appropriate. You know, this is uh, one thing. In terms of the voluntary returns, I want as well to address the issue of our Tunisian uh, friend and colleague because um, it is at the moment there is an obligation that member states should warn between seven, give between seven and thirty days of voluntary departure. So, in principle, it should not happen, and in, in, in as a general practice, does not happen or should not happen at least that the person is notified the very same day or the day before of departure, because indeed it is much more effective for the person, much more, much better, for more dignified, but also more, more practical for the person who is returning to have some time to organize his or her departure and as well his uh, coming back to the country of origin. Uh, just one point on, the, on, on reintegration, readmission development. NDACI, so the, the New Development and uh, Cooperation, Naval Cooperation Instrument, uh, will in principle include 10%. This is one of the conditions. 10% of the funding should be dedicated to migration. So this allows about 9 billion euros, I think, if I remember correctly. I mean, if my memory does not betray me. It's a lot of money. If you put this money to good use, if you put this money to the use of, of vocational training, development, you know, uh, improving and up upgrading the skills of the, of the third country nationals, and at the same time, as we are planning in the pact, you increase substantially the legal migration possibilities, I think this will go a long way in improving legal migration and giving different, more avenues and more possibilities of uh, legal migration into the EU. But indeed, 
what we need to do is to really tackle irregular migration because yes uh, we can of course uh, what uh, Ms. Strick was saying about uh, you know seeing how to maybe regularize or maybe look at the situation with regular stay in third country not in the European Union is something that does not belong to the Commission to do it's something that can be debated between member states and and the Parliament as well but the fact that someone is already regularly staying in the EU already puts this this person in a vulnerable situation, which I think has to be avoided by by all means. So I think for me, as I think Mrs. Strick as well and my, our friend as well in Tunisia said, we need we need to maximize the legal migration uh, channels. Um, we have I don't want to, of course to anticipate here the negotiation that we have with the Parliament on the return directive because of, but addressing a little bit one of the things that Mrs. Strick as well said. Of course, we are welcome. We're looking forward to the final results of the um, of the report that has been presented by Mrs. Strick. And of course, if there are areas for improvement, such as the voluntary departure period that she mentioned, uh, of course, we are more than welcome to, to to look at it and to negotiate with them and to improve the proposal. Because obviously, the proposal, when the Commission presents a proposal, we believe it is perfect, but usually it's not the case. And usually, what it is, of course, is improved through the negotiating uh, process. This, on the contrary, I would say, uh, I think in the pact, we have made a very, very big effort. And certainly, I know it's very much in the in my commissioner's mind as well, uh, that to establish this real mutually beneficial and equal partnership with third countries, where return and readmission will be one of the issues, has to be one of the issues as well. Because indeed, if we want to give good protection uh, for people who deserve protection, we also need to address, of course, return and readmission. It's part of the comprehensive approach. But it is clear that a priority will be to have a comprehensive partnership with them on economic areas, trade areas, development matters, development matters, sorry, as well as other migration matters, including legal migration and return and readmission. Because we have also to recognize that in some cases, cooperation from the third country, so the possibility of uh, accepting this right, as Mr. Strick said, is extremely, extremely limited. In some cases, it's newly filed and there's zero cooperation from the third country. This needs to be changed only and can only be changed on the basis of this mutual partnerships. One last thing concerning the reintegration programs. I indeed, I think there's a large margin for improvement. I think we have already advanced a lot, made good progress, and I think there are successes which have been scored already in the area of reintegration. But I think there is why we want to systematize a little bit more reintegration. This will be, I'm not sure about the monitoring part that Mrs. Trick said, because Monitoring implies the follow-up of a person, the following of a person. And maybe our experience is that not every individual wants to be monitored, so to say, in the post-arrival situation. I think reintegration is a much more encompassing concept, which actually brings a certain level of monitoring to a certain level, of course, of accompanying the person. And as Mrs. Strick said, and I take her point here as well, is that we need to make sure that reintegration is not only applied to voluntary returns, but also to forced returns. And that's the intention of the Commission in the context of the pact. It's already the case today, but it's going to be uh, amplified in, in the context of the pact. There are many more things, many more, more things, Anna, but I'll leave it there because I see that I'm getting you impatient. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I was just uh, thinking that uh, Kirsten uh, might also uh, have an opinion on this question and also i see that tinek uh, uh, raises her hand and wants to react to it again so uh, i would like to to first give kirsten the floor and then tinek uh, i always have an opinion if i'm asked for it uh, of course i i was first to say i'm 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 sometimes wondering because if we are all so much in favor for more legal pathways for more opportunities for legal, legal migration why don't we do it why don't we increase the financial uh, means for it, etc.? So uh, this is this is not working in my in my view. I think Tineke Strick indicated uh, the very right mix um, of approach that that would make things change to a better possibly. Um, you 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 say a knowledge interests. I think that's very crucial because both the individual. And what they can talk hours, I'm sure, about this. And and the country of origin, they have legitimate interests. But from La Valletta on, we never we never uh, opened up spaces and and time to listen to these interests and to recognize them. 
Um, we all know that remittances are far overreaching uh, ODA, but we're not acknowledging those. So in, in these negotiations, uh, be they bilateral or European Union vis-a-vis -vis the country of origin, are we actually giving enough incentives? We're just using the old corporation money while we know it's not enough as an incentive. So I think Tineke speaking about uh, regularization, also uh, visa issues um, could be interesting incentives to achieve Francesco, Francesco better cooperation by uh, these countries. But I think we, we, we need a totally new mindset of cooperation towards this cooperation and also different rhetorics. I was witnessing La Valletta press conference and we were talking on completely different terms, um, African leaders and, and European leaders. And uh, it, it gave me the clear impression that we don't even spend time to listen to each other. Um, secondly, um, I think that the pact, and this is my last sentence, sorry, Anna, uh, the pact is moving away from this alternatives to the current return policies um, uh, that Tina mentioned so well. I think it is making things worse. If we only look at the pilot uh, that is planned for Lesbos, it, we, we, we are allowing now something that the Greeks have been doing, tolerated by the European Union, we're taking people's freedoms. This has not gone through in Germany when Seehofer, our Minister of Interior, suggested we should do this at the borders, uh, neither at the airports. And now we're allowing the Greeks to, um, to and, and the European Union is, is allowing itself to create an extraterritorial space of first reception. It's only for 12 days, but it remains to be proven that it's only for 12 days and then an, an additional 12 days for, for uh, 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 returning people. Um, so there's so many legal questions to this. Uh, also the, the, the scanning, the, the, the pre-selection process. Is this, is this in the legal framework of the Geneva Convention of the national legal system of, of, a Greek, of the Greek or the Italian? I think we have to look deep into the, what, what has come up with the pact to, to really say it is within our legal obligations and commitments or it is not. I'm sure that the Commission and, and everybody has worked very hard to make it uh, compliant, but I, I'm afraid that there's loopholes to be discussed. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten. Tineke. Indeed, I, I wanted to react to uh, what Mr. Castulo said, uh, because it's true that the returns directive allows for the possibility to, to issue a residence permit for people who cannot be returned. But uh, by absence of an implementation report by the Commission, we did our own implementation report. And there it, um, it emerged that member states hardly make use of this possibility. So that raises the question, shall we just leave it to the discretion of the member states or should we just come up with a common policy on, on, on what to do with people who don't have an alternative to return to? Because Actually, the whole idea of, of the return directive is also that we will try to uh, reduce the situation that people are uh, in a limbo situation. Either they're legal here or they're illegal and then they need to return. So that also creates a responsibility to find solutions for people who cannot escape from this limbo situation. And uh, I know this is a very sensitive issue for the member states. They really want to decide on their own, you know, whether or not to regularize. But the Commission could start by by starting a discussion on this, and uh, it, because it's also, I think, one of the elements to combat uh, irregular, irregularly, uh, irregular stay. <laughs> um, yeah, regarding legal channels, uh, yeah, it's what it's it's exactly what Kristen, Kristen, Kristen said. I think okay, if everyone wants it, why don't we make legislation on that? We really had expectations that the pact would also include more legislation on this, but we only get a recommendation both to labor migration and to resettlement of refugees, which is also still in the hands of and the discretion of the member states. This is really a missed opportunity, I think. And what I would also, I'm very much favoring is right now people uh, can uh, come to the European Union mostly in an irregular way because there are hardly any legal channels. 
And if they decide to return, there's no possibility to come back ever. And uh, especially also if you get a re-entry ban. I think it's very important that we find smart ways to improve the mobility. Simply mobility between countries of origin and the EU and, you know, make it more easy to come and to come back. So that there's not, you know, that, that you stay where you are because you know you will never be able to come back again. I think that would also lead to a triple win situation because people uh, have more exchanges in businesses, in study, in whatever. They take it with them and, you know, it, it, it's enriching for everyone. Uh, and, but this is completely lacking. So we need to find uh, new ways for that. My last <laughs> remark also is on this conditionality. It's really in the policies and that's not the same as comprehensiveness. That's a completely different uh, approach. Con conditionality is that we decide, we use our incentives, our leverage to let them do what we want. And this is the opposite from comprehensiveness, I think. Uh, I think that we should indeed, what Kirsten said, more listen to, uh, to, the, to the other states to, to, to get their perception and interest and not mix up things. Uh, at the moment that we are prioritizing our migration objectives, my, our own interest, we are undermining other objectives that the EU also has very legitimately on development, on human rights, on, on, on trade. Uh, and, and these all have their, their own aims and we should not make them dependent on to what extent uh, regions cooperate on, on our own interest. I mean, in the end, we would lose them all uh, also with our own external policies. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to read one comment that we received in the Q&A. Um, it's from a Tunisian um, participant um, who says, and I'm going to speak in, uh, I'm going to read it in French. Um, les migrants refusent d'habiter. Usually migrants do not want to go back in their country because they do not trust their country of origin. Reinforcing voluntary uh, returns will only deviate our glance from the real problems. Sorry, <laughs> this question, but it's a good one. So, um, as our time is really running out and we haven't talked about return partnerships, we haven't really talked about readmission agreements, um, I would still ask for a last short round um, of kind of last words for, for today. I'm sure we're going to continue this this, this discussion. Um, and I would like to start with Vashti, and I would really like to ask you to be, like every one of you, very on point. Well, on a final note, I'd like to stress that Tunisia is the first country that cooperates with Italy on a forced return before Nigeria and Egypt. Back in 2019, 1,045 people were expelled, and out of them, 56 took a, a chartering aircraft. And for the year 2020, and in spite of the uh, pandemic, seven flights with 85 uh, passengers uh, expelled to uh, Tunisia. The other speakers mentioned the uh, mobility partnerships and the uh, readmission programs. Now, I'd like to mention that uh, Tunisia is uh, negotiating a uh, mobility partnership and the uh, readmission agreement are one part of such partnership. There are indeed agreements between Tunisia and some European countries and very often these agreements are very simple. They are um, arrangements 
that uh, try to avoid any parliamentary scrutiny and because uh, by doing so, the uh, document uh, will not be published. So it's a lack of transparency for the people seeking to understand the content of, of such an agreement. Uh, uh, more flexibility is granted to Tunisia when it comes to uh, uh, Schengen visas, but only for some categories of people, for qualified workers that uh, would be allowed to uh, leave the country. However, this would uh, deprive Tunisia of uh, highly qualified and uh, skilled uh, workers uh, that would be uh, who would be admitted uh, within the uh, Schengen area. Now, what uh, civil society would like to see is to have uh, other categories of people admitted uh, through the uh, circular migration uh, patterns for seasonal workers, for instance. Now, I do see that Anna is stressing out, so I will, I will stop here and thank you for your participation. Uh, first, Tineke and then Mr. Gastelumeski is uh, also the possibility to have last sentences for Sorry, yeah. it's me, huh? Okay. Yeah, it's Sorry. you. <laughs> I was just still playing with the language interpretation. Um, yeah, very briefly, I, I, what I think is very important that we take a more rational approach, that we really look at uh, what works, what doesn't work, uh, and that we that we are not let ourselves being hostage by political firm rhetorics or whatever, because you know it's 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 return policies is often, uh, uh, um, well, uh, subjected to this uh, politicization. It doesn't bring us nowhere. Uh, so uh, let's really look what works or not, but then based on proportionality for the third country, for the migrant. So uh, no repression if not needed, based on human dignity and based on uh, um, on equal partnership uh, with other countries. Uh, but that evidence-based also means do impact assessments, uh, do monitoring, uh, do it also not only on the returns, but also on our cooperation with third countries. Uh, if we conclude a deal, do a human rights impact assessment before, because it can mean that refugees get stuck in third countries, for instance, without access to protection. So evidence-based, rational, but uh, uh, departing from the principle of based on the principle of human rights and human dignity and proportionality. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Gastelo Mesquites, there's still one question that just came in, <laughs> which is directed to you. I don't know if you want to answer it in your last uh, comment or if we should send it to you and then maybe you can uh, answer the question afterwards. Yes, like, up to you, up to you. So then uh, we're going to transfer the question to you. Okay, very good. Just, you know, uh, two or three sentences um, to really, I think, in this debate is also important. I think we fully agree, of course, on having a rational debate on this, you know, as depolluted as possible from, you know, uh, you know, banal rhetorics. This is very clear. Uh, from the Commission side, um, just to, for example, to, um, to give a clarification on the use of visa, of, of visa facilitation, for example. In the new proposal for what we call visa leverage, the two possibilities exist to give better visa treatment to third country nationals and third countries if cooperation on returns is, is good, satisfactory, or worse, if it is very poor. So, you know, both possibilities exist there somehow. It's only the negative side is looked at, uh, you know, from what I hear as well, sometimes been reported. But both possibilities exist. So, clearly, the Commission is going to listen and has always listened to third countries. I think there's no other. Uh, you know, institution. I think that the European Union has been listening to third countries constantly. We have now a new African strategy. 
who are going to work closely, closely with our countries. So conditionality does not exist in, in, in the SEI. The only thing that exists is really that in the area of mutual partnerships, we will listen to them, but they should also listen to us a little bit. Okay, so it is a mutual listening as well, listening to her to their interests and then listening to our interests uh, as well. So, um, and just the last sentence, because I know we're running out of time. I think if you read, if we read the text that the, the Commission has presented in the pact very carefully, and I'm not entering now in the screening proposal or in the on the legality or not legality. Of course, we have looked and have we have made our, our text fully compliant with the legality and making sure that all loopholes are closed. But okay, I mean, of course, we are more than ready to listen as well to opinions from from other other stakeholders. That that's very clear. But uh, if you look at the pact very carefully, there are. There's a richness, a wealth of proposals in how to improve legal migration with the talent partnerships, with the resettlement, uh, uh, with as well uh, the circular migration. A number of proposals mean, mean made there which are going to be followed up by specific and precise implementation measures by the Commission following the pact, which I think can transform the way legal migration is managed between the Commission, between the European Union and third countries. I was the one who launched the current resettlement framework I think it's now six, seven years ago. We started with 700 people. Now we are about 40,000 people. So we cannot, as well as Europeans, simply say we haven't done anything. We have done things. We have made a lot of progress. But we have to continue. Of course, we have to continue making sure that, you know, indeed, all these areas, in particular, the area of return, returns are indeed of better quality and more effective. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Kirsten, um, as you started this meeting uh, with your presentation, I would also like to give you the the last uh, words on the on the topic, and then I will wrap up. <laughs> Gladly so. I, I just wanted to, you know, I'm I'm thinking while I'm listening. I just wanted to uh, conclude maybe by saying uh, and reminding us very much we're talking about real people. Uh, and the fate of real people. And I think what uh, the studies uh, provided me personally with, but also my colleagues and, and, and people around us is, is better, better ways into these real people's re realities. I mean, I learned a lot from, from the different chapters on the different countries. Um, and there's a lot of photographs in the book you will find of these real peoples we've been talking to and their real stories. And uh, I think this links very nicely with uh, what, what, uh, what Tineke and Francesca have been saying about uh, trying to find smart policies. I mean, that's, that's only what we can achieve, um, do better in, in what, we, what we are aspiring to do. Um, I like very much the expression smart ways of mobility. I think it also uh, goes away from such polluted terms as irregular migration, illegal migration, and so on. Let's talk about mobility and smart ways. Um, let's put these terms back on the table because what we feared and one main reason why we did the publication was that the overwhelming trend is to look into one direction, making it more effective means raising the numbers regardless, and then people become numbers. We are effective because we achieve more in numbers. Um, but you talked a lot about quality and I, I really appreciated uh, this term. So I think we look into smart ways of mobility as opposed to what we're witnessing now, which uh, Tineke also rightly said was a missed chance by the commission and uh, being more courageous and putting these things into the wording and, and into the documents, uh, making them more open also to realities outside. It's a bit self-referential still and a bit too much crisis mode. We are still operating in since 2015. And it's a bit too much uh, influenced by this populist trends to, to, uh, to raise the worst fears in our, in our populations. And I think we need, uh, as I said, a different mindset, different rhetorics back on the table. And I thought this was a, a brilliant uh, debate in that sense. Thank you very much for organizing it.
Thank you all. Thank you all for the debate, for the discussion, for um, the question you also raised to each other. I'm, I'm very sure that's not going to be the last one we're going to discuss uh, on this topic. Um, I'm very much looking forward to our next uh, debate. Um, I would like to uh, thank uh, the um, the panel. I want to thank also our technical support team, which helped us uh, with the or, um, with the technical issues today. Uh, I want to uh, uh, thank my colleagues Anja and Juan in the uh, background because um, this is also very important. Um, and also, I really want to thank our two interpreters for today that um, helped us with the um, language barriers that. Uh, otherwise uh, would have been there maybe um and um yeah it only for me it's only to say a very nice afternoon to you wish a very nice afternoon to you and goodbye see you next time okay thank you also bye thank you thank you anna thank you very much bye